Great, so welcome to uh, another class about the branch spaces. And uh, today's class, so class four, um, we will uh, work through uh, some definitions of the Poya class. And today it's supposed to be a more like relaxed uh, class. It won't it probably should finish um, just about one hour, not one hour and a half as I used to. Uh, so, um, so, so far we have seen uh, what, what we did so far. Well, so far we did the fragment Lindelof about functions in the upper half plane. And if you get a bound on the line, then you could get a bound in the upper half plane. What else? Uh, if we have a function on the upper half plane, which has a positive real part, then we could characterize such a function that was Poisson uh, summation, uh, sorry, Poisson uh, inversion. No, that was Poisson representation. There's so many Poisson theorems. And then, uh, Later on, we did uh, the last class, we did the LP spaces, which was kind of a introduction to what would be the Brown spaces. And this was constructed using this P function, which was just a given function phi uh, in the upper half plane, which had a positive, no negative real part. And from a function like this, we created a space which we call L phi, which was a Hilbert space of uh, not entire functions, but functions which are analytic in the upper half plane and for which uh, can be represented by basically um, um, Cauchy's integral for a measure. Not mistaken, was that the representation functions that can be represented like this? Okay, so now we move to uh, to the talks about some properties of entire functions. And the first first class we wanted to work on is so-called the Poya class. Okay, so this uh, so so these series of uh, chapters, let me see here. I think it's chapter seven. Yes, set chapter seven up to chapter 15. This would be like preparations uh, for defining the, the, the brown space, okay? Oh, great, so what's the Poya class? So I will use the symbol P, the brown doesn't use that, but this is common in the literature to use the symbol, so we use it. So the Poya class P would be uh, the set of entire functions. Oh, this would be functions defined in the whole complex plane. So E entire. And such that they, they satisfy three properties. One, the first property is that they don't have any zeros in the upper half plane. Okay. The second property is that, so they could have uh, real zeros, for instance. The second property is that they have this inequality. for every z in the upper half plane. And the third is that if I fix a real x and a very y, then this function is non-decreasing. For positive y. Okay, and this, uh, is the Poya class. 
okay? Um, so this inequality here, you will see a lot. In fact, the strict inequality, you will see a lot. Uh, but one way to uh, represent this graphically is that if you have here, let's say, the complex plane here, let's say, so this is X and this is Y. And then if you pick a point, let's say Z here, then you take it, uh, you reflect this point uh, using the real axis to Z bar, then E here at this point, E moduli is larger than E at this other point. This is something to keep in mind, a, a picture to keep in mind. Uh, so remarks about this definition. The first remark, um, is that, um, well, uh, the Poya class P, so let's say remark one, P is closed by, well, product or multiplication. And this is kind of obvious, and if you have two functions which are entire and they are in the Poya class, then the product belong to the Poya class because, well, obviously position one will still be satisfied. And these two also because, well, the inequality would just be satisfied because the product is satisfying them. And this also because if you multiply two non-decreasing functions, then the product is two, still is non-decreasing. Uh, non-decreasing positive functions, which, is, which these things are. Great, so it's closed by the product, but also it's closed by uniform convergence. And uniform convergence. Okay, so what I mean by this, I mean that, so that is, oops. If you have a sequence of En in the class P and En converge to a certain function E uniformly in compact sets, see, or as the Burns likes to say, uniformly in bounded sets, which will be the same thing here. Uh, it would generate the same topology anyway. Um, so if you have this, then E belongs to P, okay? And why is that? Well, because um, there, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, so the first, so second inequality Second condition would be true because, well, if you take a limit of things that satisfy this, so the limit, the pointwise limit would still satisfy this, okay? That's, that's easy. This also is more or less easy because, well, this is basically the same thing as this one because this just means that once you fix X and you take two Y's, let's say Y1 greater than Y2, then you have a certain inequality for each uh, n. But then in the limit, this inequality will still hold because the limit is also point, point wise. So you have this, the same inequality. And so therefore, property t three will still be satisfied. So the only problem would be this, but if you recall the some results, some basic results of our complex analysis, have a if you have a sequence of functions and you know that the limit function has a zero at some point, so suppose it has a zero here, then that means that once you, once, you, once you put any region around that point and once you take n sufficiently large, then the functions which are converging to this function E, which has a zero in that point, these ENs have to 
have some zeros and these zeros need to converge to this one, okay? And also have the same multiplicity as they get closer, okay? This, I think it's called uh, Hurwitz theorem, okay? And uh, if you Google it, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you can see the proof, it's, it's, it's very easy. You use, I think, use the argument principle. So you use the fact that you can count the number of zeros of a function uh, inside a region just by a counter integration of the logarithmic the derivative of the function. So that would be just a, an integer counting the number of zeros if the function is analytic in the region. And then will that limit, uh, that integral has to converge to, to the limit. So they, so this, if you use, so maybe I can even write something here, then I can erase. So you, if you just use this, in a counter integral, say you have a zero, suppose, so suppose E has a zero in the upper half plane, let's say. So this is a point in the upper half plane, P and then E of P zero. I won't show that it's impossible. Well, you just take a counter around this point. So this will be the number of zeros of EN inside that region, inside this region here. But this has to converge to this, because it's converging uniformly. And therefore, uh, these integers here have to converge to this integer, which is supposed to be like a, the, the multiplicity, let's say multiplicity of P. So therefore, it, it must be the case that when N is sufficiently large, this thing is exactly equal to, uh, to MP. Uh, so then you do the 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 the, 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 the trick that well, uh, if it just has one zero, uh, suppose the zero is has multiplicity, uh, let's say a billion, and then you divide by um, uh, a billion minus one, so it has multiplicity one. So you know that this has to converge with the same multiplicity, and then you just increase. Okay. So using this, you can easily show that uh, it can't be that the function e has zeros uh, on the upper half plane. Any questions here? Okay. So it's a simple exercise from basic things in, in complex analysis. So the second thing is, second remark is that we can uh, further, and we will use that in a moment, reduce conditions two and three to one single condition, which is the following inequality. Let me write the way I'm going to use it. Um, yes. And this works for every y for every h greater equal than zero and for every z in the upper half plane, okay? So basically what I'm saying, if you just shift the function a little bit up here by adding this, uh, this i h here, then um, this inequality has to hold and this is equivalent to two and three. And this is really easy to see because Again, if you go to the complex plane and you need to take, let's say height here, H, so this is uh, IH, this is, oh, this is X and this is Y. So of course that if I take, let's say Z in here, well, let, me, let me put closer. Of course, if I take Z in here, then what I'm doing here is just adding IH uh, uh, to, to there and subtracting IH to there. Uh, oh, sorry. So let me. Uh, no, let me write it this in the explicit form. This is equivalent. 
course, that this is equivalent. Let me try writing so we can better explain this. Okay, so of course, if you take, uh, um, so what you're doing here is you have just uh, h minus y in here and h plus y in there, okay? So that means that, well, if you take a point such that uh, y, such that uh, uh, h minus y is still positive, so let's say y less than h, Okay, so for instance, uh, if this would correspond you to put a point Z here, which is not bigger than two H. So then uh, you would have a point here and you would still have a point there. So of course that by condition two, uh, E at this point would be larger than E at this point. The problem is when you move this point up and you take another guy here, then, um, then this y is very big, then h minus y would be negative. So it would be something like here, okay? But then we, we, what you know is that, well, this point there uh, is, e at this point is less or equal than e at the conjugate, but the conjugate would be something here, let's see. Let's do the conjugate would be uh, before the point you took. So then again, you use the factors non-decreasing the upper half plane. So this point would be less or equal than this. So this is greater than this, and this is greater than that. Therefore, this is greater than this guy. So, so, so what I mean, um, that this guy, this guy is less or equal than this, and this guy is less or equal than that. Therefore, this guy is greater or equal than this guy. For a moment, I explained without <laughs> making any notes in the tablet. Um, but it's, uh, or, or you can just do the, the, the actual numerical proof with the eights and, 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 and y's and you see that works. But this is just a geometrical uh, way of seeing it. Uh, and then you can go back because the same thing, uh, it, go back is more or less easy as well because if you put h equals zero, that's exactly condition two. So if you put h equals zero, that's exactly condition two. And, um, and if you want to show that uh, it's non-decreasing, so if you take two points here, and then you just take an h, which lies exactly in the middle, and this inequality here would tell you that e at this point is greater than e at this point, e model i, of course. Okay, so this is also easy to see. Any questions here as well? I have a question about remark one. Yeah. Because um, I'm a bit confused about the first, uh, about the uniform convergence. So, I mean, if you take some constants, they're of polyar class, right? Yes. And if they, if these constants are, let's say, positive and converge to zero. Yes. Then that should be uniformly in compact sets. Yep. But I mean, the zero constant is not a polyar class anymore. Yes, good, good thing to notice. So, um, so what you're saying is that if I do, so you need some kind of condition probably. This, then oh. I, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's up to the customer. Uh, you can define polyar class to say, well, it either is the zero function or the definition of the polyar class because uh, the polyar class excludes the zero function. I guess for a good reason, since we're looking uh, at the product uh, as, uh, let's say, the, uh, the group structure in there, let's say. So then you want to avoid the zero but you could include, include it artificially. Otherwise you always have, as you mentioned correctly, you always have to like impose this. Okay, if it's non-zero, then of course it will be of polyar class. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Now thanks for, 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 for the remark, that's, uh, 
important, important to notice. Okay. What else? Um, okay, so now let's state the main result. Theorem seven, and it's the following. So E, so if you have a function of part of class, then it has the following uh, Hadamard factorization. Um, and then you have an exponential term. And then we have a product. So let me tell you what these numbers are. So uh, here uh, R is uh, the multiplicity of the zero at the origin. So R could be zero, for instance. So R is the multiplicity of the zero at origin. What else? Um, um, A has to be a non-negative real number. B has to be a uh, complex number with no negative real part. The Zn bars are the zeros of E, removing the zero at the origin if he has one, and hn on this number is uh, xn divided by xn squared, y is yn squared, uh, where here I'm writing zn as xn plus i yn, where yn is positive. Okay, so, uh, so the e function will have only zeros in the lower half plane, so, but the Bruns likes to write it as the conjugate of a point uh, in the closed upper half plane. So y, oh, yn could be even zero, greater or equal than zero. Okay. Um, what else we could say? Yeah, that's it. So proof oh I, I should say something I should say one more thing before the proof um, where we have where we have a, a sort of convergence of the zeros and this would be part of the proof It's finite, okay. And that's uh, really important because this product representation here will only converge if we have this convergence condition here on the zeros. Okay. And yn is just another way of writing, uh, not yn, sorry. If, if you want to compare the res this representation with the usual how the model representation, the usual one, we use this, just this. Uh, and the only difference is that I'm taking the real part of this bit here. So HN is just the real part of one over ZN bar. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's show this thing. And this will be only the the only uh, theorem for today. Okay. So first we have to recall problem line. 
if you haven't solved it yet, uh, it's okay because I will recall it now, but it will be a problem. It will be important for, for this proof. So what problem nine is saying? Problem nine is saying that if, let me give a name here. If star uh, is true, so if I if you are given zeros such that these zeros uh, converge, that's what I mean in this form, then the product, let's say e naught, let's not even say e naught, let's say p infinity, because then we use this notation in a moment. One minus z z n bar e to z h n converges, defines an uh, entire function that belongs to the Poyer class. Okay, so uh, that is, I mean, in more details, that is, if I define p n of z equals just, let's say, the product up to n, then this guy converges to, to P infinity and this P infinity belongs to player class. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And each of, each, each of these terms, this is also part of problem nine, each of these terms, let me put here, also belong to the player class. Each of these polynomials times this exponential factor. Okay, so that's problem nine. And to prove problem nine, you have to prove a series of uh, inequalities. So to show that this uh, product here has a limit in the uniform topology. And if they all belong to the Poyet class as the problem will state, then we know now that by, uh, uh, since Poyet class is closed under uniform convergence, then the limit will belong to the Poyet class. Another way of showing that there isn't zeros in the question you asked uh, before, assuming that the limit is not zero, is to show that actually, if the function is non-zero, then this function here is increasing. It can't be, if, if you imagine, well, this guy can't be constant. I mean, if you go to the upper half plane, like this, it can't be constant in an interval here, otherwise the function will be constant, okay? So uh, if you remove constant, so if you say that this, this guy here is not a constant, the limit, then, uh, um, or, or each one of these functions here are not constant. I think the limit, yes, if the limit is not a constant, then, um, then, uh, so what I'm trying to say, okay, so what I'm trying to say is that property three is actually stronger, is a decreasing function, uh, is an increasing function, not just non-decreasing, if E is not a constant. So if E is not constant, then we actually have a stronger property three. And then you can use that to show that uh, the limit in particular, this will show that uh, E doesn't have any zeros on the upper half plane because it will increase. It will increase when you go up, so it can never have a zero because uh, it's because the function is positive and no negative for this. Okay, so then you can also use that. I think that's what the Bruns do in the book. In, implicitly, in the proof of theorem seven, he shows that the Poyet class is closed under uniform convergence. And what he do is this trick. He uses that uh, this non-decreasing property, which I, I won't use. I would just say that it's closed on the multiplication because it follows from this abstract uh, complex analysis uh, results. Great. So let me uh, uh, 
prove uh, the theorem. So for that, we need two lemmas. Um, lemma one, if E belongs to the Poya class, so lemma, basically lemma one and lemma two is to deal with the exponential uh, corrections in the Poya class uh, factorization. And the fact that you can cut off zeros, you can remove some zeros. Okay, so suppose that E belongs to the Poya class and you have a zero, okay? Then you can definitely cut that zero, remove that zero, and it's still in the Poya class, okay? Let's show that. How can we show that? So by the remark I said, um, well, definitely I still don't have zeros in the upper half plane because I'm removing a zero. So that property one of being Poya class is still good. This guy is still okay. So I just have to show two and three, but we know that two and three is just this guy here. Okay, so let me, uh, let me show let me do it with something clever. Let me copy this and let me write. We know that then I can paste. We know this is true. Okay. And we have to show the same for, for the function f. So let's say f of z equals this, okay? So we have to, to do the following. We have to do f of z plus i h, z bar divided by f of z plus i h. And we have to show that this is less or equal than one whenever z is in the upper half plane. That's the condition. Uh, so that looks like a fragment linear of uh, thing, which will, will be. So let me just write what this is. So this will be, uh, this will be EZ bar plus IH divided by Z plus IH minus W bar, the bar here with the moduli and then this guy. Okay. And then, well, we know by this condition here above that this would be less or equal than just the, the linear fractions. See, if we rearrange, we have this. Okay. So this, you can write something like this. This is the O of moduli I of Z divided by O of moduli I of Z, say when Z is in the upper half plane, for instance, um, which the, the part we are interested. So basically, you know that, well, this is like a linear problem, linear thing divided by a linear thing. So if we call the condition in the fragment linear of uh, uh, maximum principle, uh, we had this log, we had to take the log of a function along an arc. So you have an arc here from minus a to a, and a is super large, and you have to take the log of this function. So if I want to apply the fragment Lindelof maximum principle to this guy, I need to take the log of this, okay? But when I take the log of something like that, it was again, just grow like the log. Okay, but in the end, I have, if you recall, the, there was this condition, which is one over a certain integral, I think it's about zero to pi, and then you take the log, I think log plus, or whatever you want to do, I don't know, and e to, uh, again, this, maybe you should write it 
right? It was like one over a zero to pi, and then was like log plus of whatever was your target function at a i theta, or maybe sine theta, something like that. The theta, and that has to go to zero when a goes to infinity. That was the condition of the fragment in the uh, maximum principle. So if the function here grows like linearly, then that's okay because this would still be just log plus of a, maybe o of this. And when you divide by a, this will go to zero. Okay, which is the case because this is just the quotient of two linear factors. So, okay, so I can apply fragment window of principle and we conclude that the maxima of this guy here is attained at the real line. But at the real line, but note that this guy here at a z equals x, okay? If you do the computation, well, it's exactly equal to one, no? Because yes, it's exactly equal to one because if you put x here, this is exactly the same thing. So is equal to one. Okay, therefore it has to be bounded by one in the Hopfner plane by the fragment in the love. Therefore, this is true. And this is exactly what we wanted to show because this is equivalent to condition two and three. Okay, so this finishes the lemma. Okay, so this was the first nice application of the fragment in the love. A second because we used uh, another one uh, before. I think in theorem four, I guess. Okay, any questions in this, in this lemma? Great. So the second lemma is about the exponential factor. If E belongs to P, of course, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's move, move on. Uh, if E belongs to P and E has no zeros, then E has to be this guy here, where A is greater or equal than zero and the real part of B is greater or equal than zero. Okay, so uh, a nice way to characterize a Gaussian um, with a positive guy here, is to ask it to be a function in a class with no zeros. Okay, so uh, proof. Okay, so it doesn't have zeros. So log is defined in the whole complex plane. And then for we can write, uh, the log of E is uh, defined, so therefore we can write E as E to the F and F would be the log of E. And the condition that it is on Poya class implies that we have the real part of Z bar plus I H is less or equal to the real part of Z plus I H. Okay, Z in the F half plane, H greater or equal than zero. Okay, because the condition about the moduli is, will be transferred about the con, in a condition about the real part of F. Great. So then, well, it's clear what we have to do now. Well, we have something which, which has no negative real part here. So if I define GH of Z to be 
f of z plus i h minus f of z bar plus i h. Then I know that it's real part, real part of is greater or equal than zero in the upper half plane. Uh, for y positive. And therefore, um, what else? And on the real line, it's zero, because if you notice the real part of gh at the real line, what you do, oh, sorry, I forgot this, of course. The function has to be analytic, so I have to do a double bar, dot bar in the variable and bar outside. So now this thing here is analytic, okay? And well, the real part of something equals the real part of the bar. So we can even put the bar here. Oh, not here, the other one. Of the conjugate, okay. So now uh, we are good. And when I put X real, you see that what we have here is just the imaginary part. So it's something, uh, purely imaginary, because I'm just taking something minus conjugate. So then the real part is zero uh, for X real. Okay, so then I think that's problem three. So problem three implies that GH of Z is just some minus I P Z plus IC, where P is greater or equal than zero. It has to be linear and it has to be of this form. Of course, at least P can depend on the H. But uh, one way, so now what, what, what we should do is just differentiate twice, let's say Z, GH, and realize that it is zero because it's linear. So you take double derivative is zero. So therefore you conclude that F, let's say prime prime of Z plus IH equals F prime prime of Z bar plus IH bar. Oh, uh, let me put that on the real line only. And I put, let me put, let's say Y equals zero. Okay, so that implies what? That implies that the real part, or oh, sorry, that the imaginary part of F prime prime of X plus IH is identically zero. Okay, so I differentiated G, great, that would be zero, okay. Um, and then I, well, I took this and I put that Y equals zero and see what I got. I got that. That implies that the imaginary part of this is zero for X real. But this works for any H greater or equal than zero. So that would imply that F prime prime of Z is just some real constant. This is just some constant, real constant. So let me see, let's see some real constant, which in particular implies that f of z should be some quadratic polynomial, which I will write conveniently this way, uh, minus uh, some Let's see, some plus some C. And then what do we have now? Okay, then what you do is that you go back to G of H of Z using this definition here. We know, okay. And then what you get is what? I think you get is this one here. 
Yes. So what you get is this thing here. To just do the computation, just replace this formula here in this thing here. And then what you get is this. You get 4A H Y plus 2Y U part of B. Yeah, because well, we're doing a difference here. Okay. And this part remains unchanged when you do this difference. So this, this linear term will go away. And if you track down what happens with the other terms, that's what is going to happen. So this has to be greater or equal than zero for all y positive and all y and h positive. Greater or equal than zero. So that implies that a has to be greater or equal than zero and real part of P has to be greater or equal to zero. You just put uh, H equals zero, then that definitely shows that the real part has to be greater or equal to zero. And then uh, what you can do then is to put, let's say, uh, Y, you can put Y equals zero, but you can factor Y, and then you put, um, yes, you can factor Y, this has to be greater or equal to zero then you can put, you can send, let's say, uh, h to infinity, okay? And this has to be, remain greater or equal than zero, so a has to be greater or equal than zero. Okay, that finishes the lemma. Any questions here? Now we can continue with the proof of the main result. Okay. So, uh, so let's continue with the proof. Now we can. The proof of theorem seven. So what we're going to do. So first of all, we're going to assume certain things uh, which and now clear by the lemmas, well, since I can cut down zeros, I could definitely cut down the zero at the origin. Okay, so I can assume that the function E at the origin is one, for instance, so I can assume that uh, E at the origin is one. If not, I just cut down a bunch of zeros. Um, Okay, and then therefore, therefore the only thing I have to show is that, um, I mean, I don't have to show much things now. And so now I define this PN of Z, I think I already defined above, but I can write it again. We know by problem nine that these guys belong to Poya class. And then I can define and then I can define these functions uh, Fn, which would be just E divided by Pn. And we also know that these E's belong to the Poya class by the lemma, because I'm here I'm just cutting down zeros. So I'm applying the lemma for this part, cutting down zeros. And we have these exponential factors, okay? But this won't change anything because this HK, uh, these exponential factors are, um, they, uh, they won't affect the, the property that the function is in the Poya class because when you take the moduli of them, this HK here is real. So when you take the moduli of them, this is gonna be just X HK, okay? So it's positive and it's constant along vertical lines. So that won't affect any of the properties of the Poya class, okay? So whenever you multiply by a, such a factor, it won't affect anything. So then we're still being in the point class. So this is basically by, this is basically by lemma one. 
Okay. And then problem nine, problem nine, you know that Pn converges to a certain function, P infinity, and that P infinity also belongs to Boyer class. Well, in particular then, well, since Fn is just EO divided by Pn, and we don't have any problems by dividing E by P infinity because we're just cutting down zeros. So we still have something analytic. So Fn would then converge to F infinity, also uniformly in compact sets, and that would be just P infinity. And since Fn belongs to the Poya class, the, its limit has to belong to Poya class. But now F infinity has no zeros. because we just remove everything. Okay, so then this implies a lemma two, that F infinity, since it is a void class, must have this, this form. And that finishes the proof. And it, it, it is in this part where De Bruns does this argument using the property three, the decreasing non-decreasing property, uh, to show that um, f infinity is still on Poya class. But what he's really doing is showing that that could be applied to any kind of limit. What he's really doing is that showing that. Um, the Poya class is closed uh, under uniform conversions on compact sets. Okay. Any questions here in this proof? Okay, so to finish the class, I would just do an example and solve uh, problem 18. Okay. as an example. Um, I won't give any problems uh, this Thursday because we already have uh, problems, but next Tuesday I will give probably four or five problems between problems 10 and yeah. 23, so we'll probably select four or five between problems 10 and 23. But this is for next Tuesday. Okay, so let me just solve this one. So what's the problem? The problem is uh, uh, show that cosine of Z is a function of Poya class and use its factorization to show, basically to show the power of complex analysis. This was an open problem for a long time in the time of Euler, but then he solved squared, okay, to show that. So let me show that. Okay, so why cosine is a function of Poyer class is actually a simple uh, computation. So if you use, so let's say solution. So if you use the fact that cosine of z equals e to i z plus e to minus i z over two, then what you can do is that you can do this. Oh. Sorry, I have to go back to the theorem. Nobody complained. There was a missing piece here, of course. Now I realize I can't possibly apply problem nine. Where, where did I apply problem nine? Yes, here. 
I have to go back to this thing. It was too fast. I can't apply problem nine because problem nine has the condition. And the condition on problem nine is a convergence condition on the zeros. Okay, so let me move this, this thing here. Let me sit down below here. So we have more space. Let me not finish the proof. Nobody complains, so nobody's paying attention, I guess. Uh, or I went too fast, probably I went too fast. And just believe me because I say, thing, I say things with authority and you just follow my lead. That's probably the case. Um, okay, so why, so why I can apply problem nine So problem nine had a condition. Let me go back to the part where I remember problem nine. Yes, this is the part where I remember problem nine. And problem nine has a condition, which is this convergence condition. So to apply it, I need to show this convergence condition is true, okay? Then that would fix the proof and then we are happy. But it's actually pretty simple. Just a simple computation. Uh, what you do is you just realize that if you take the, this derivative here of the polynomial P, the way I define it, differentiate Y. Another way of writing this is just to take the real part of I Pn prime of Z divided by P, I'm sorry. And you compute that, it's a simple computation because P is just a finite product of things. I mean, P is right there. This is a finite product of things you can compute. And then you see that this is just sum from K equals one to N of one plus Y K divided by X minus X K squared plus y plus yk is squared. Okay, but we do know that by definition that, well, we do know, let me write here, we do know that E equals Pn times Fn. That, that's the way I define Fn. Okay, in particular, if you do this derivative for E, you get, The same for P, this guy here, plus, so you get plus the same for Fn. Okay. But Fn is a function of Poyot class. And this is because of lemma, what? Because of lemma one. Because again, I'm basically just cutting zeros and adding some exponential factors, which I explained doesn't change the fact that the function is a Poya class. So Fn is a Poya class. In particular, Fn is a known decreasing function in the upper half plane when I differentiate this thing for y positive. So of course I'm considering here uh, y positive. Um, in particular, so this is non-decreasing. So if you take the log, it's still non-decreasing. So that term here is greater or equal than zero. Okay. So that implies that the, this thing, and now I will evaluate this already. And I'm going to evaluate this at z equals um, zero. Okay, so this is a fixed number. Computable, why it makes sense? Because I, I was assuming that e of zero was one. Okay, so I can definitely take the log around the origin, I can definitely differentiate there. Okay, so everything would make sense. 
So then I can use this inequality here and show that this is just greater or equal than that sum, but that sum here evaluated at zero is exactly what we want. Okay. And so since this works for every n, so this implies that is finite, and that's why we can apply. Lim, uh, problem nine. Okay, so that that now we finish the proof. Uh, I still got a question. For yes. This. So um, where you wrote that the real part of this i over p n prime is equal to the sum. Oh uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there in the book it says that it's not one plus y k but y plus y k in the denominator. Oh, let me check. Maybe you correct. Um, oh yes, it's y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it has to be y. Yes. Okay, and then, and then in the last line where you plug in z equals to zero. Oh, yes. And it should be, but now why do we get this convergence that we want? Oh, because we just know, okay. Yeah, so that's finite, great. Then you go back here and just put, let's say X uh, equals zero and Y equals one. Okay, um, so let me, instead of putting this, let me, let me put, let's see, one over there. So that would be plus one is squared. Oh. And then this is plus one. Let's stop the right. Yeah, that's that's good, yes. But definitely this being what I'm trying to say, definitely this being finite is the same as asking. Mm. Okay. This being finite. Thanks again. It seems that you're the only one paying attention. Uh, yes, great, thanks. So this implies that this is finite. So this sum is finite, but definitely this being finite is the same as this being finite by the reason that, uh, um, well, this one here won't matter too much, okay. Um, well, for, for one reason, we do know that this part would be finite because you just put x equals zero, y equals zero. Then this part is definitely finite, the sum. And then if I, let's say, put x equals zero and y equals one, then we get this. That is definitely greater than, let's say, if I remove this, um, we have to be careful with something. No, I don't have to be careful with something here because, well, the function is entire. So the zeros can't accumulate, meaning that xk and yk can go to infinity. Okay, I'm numbering, of course, that I'm numbering the zeros so that uh, I, uh, in order of magnitude or so in, in any way that uh, when k goes to infinity, the, the zero, the model i of, that k goes to infinity, when k goes to infinity, okay? And I'm numbering all the zeros, okay? That way this one here won't, won't matter, okay? Uh, this would be tricky in uh, the following uh, uh, factorization what we would do because it could be accumulation of zeros at the real line. That's why I would stop a little bit to think about, but it, in this case, it's okay. Again, any questions here? Maybe I went too fast. Now everything seems plausible. Great, so let me go back to 
problem 18. Now we can move a little bit up this guy. Great. So then what we do is just we take the log derivative of the moduli. Let me see if it's not what I did. What I was trying to do here was to show, oh yes, was to show that is a Poya class. Yes, if you do this, what do you get? Hmm. What you get is the following. You get e to 2y minus e to minus 2y divided by model i of e to i z plus e to minus i z squared. Pretty sure you get that. Uh, well, you just, oh, that this, it has to be, uh, yes, it has to be that. Because well, when you, when you differentiate this, this thing is just equal, you use that formula, this thing is just equal to real part of i cos prime of z divided by cos of z. And then you just use that formula here. So you would get uh, with the minus here divided with, with the stuff with the plus, and then you multiply and divide by the conjugate of the denominator. So you get this, and then you get some four terms in, in the numerator. And then once you take multiply by, take the real part, you get that. Okay, the important thing is that this thing is positive. Y positive. Okay, so therefore, uh, uh, this thing is decreasing uh, for as a function of Y positive. Um, what else? Yes, decreasing as a function of y positive is strictly decreasing. Therefore, it doesn't have any zeros on the upper half plane. Sorry, decreasing, increasing. So it's strictly increasing as a function of y positive. Therefore, it doesn't have any zeros on the upper half plane. Great. Uh, and also, uh, cosine of z bar is just cosine of z bar. So that first condition, uh, not the first condition, the second condition of being a Poya class that, uh, that if you take a point in the upper half plane and take its conjugate at the function, model i of the function in the upper half plane uh, is greater or equal than the model i of the function in the, uh, in the conjugate point. This would definitely be true with equality actually because of that. Okay, and also since it doesn't have any zeros in the upper half plane, I just showed by this identity here, it also doesn't have zeros in the lower half plane. So the only zeros are on the real line and we know what those are. Those have to be uh, odd multiples of pi over two. So then for it belongs to Poya class. And we can do its factorization. It would be a product of what? In, in the integers of one minus z divided by pi, 2n plus one over two, and then e z in the h n would just be pi over two, 2n two plus one. And then we possibly have some exponential factors. Okay, but another way of writing this, you can match because well, cosine is an even function. So you can match, uh, let's say, so the zeros would be one, two, three, four, uh, one, three, five, seven, et cetera, or the odd numbers and the negative ones. So if you match the positives with the negatives, what you get is just greater or equal than zero of one minus z divided by pi squared over four, two n plus one is squared. This term here will vanish, we go away because if we match something positive with the negative counterpart, and then you would just have this. And now I claim that A is zero and B has to be zero. Okay, so how, how can we do that? 
So if you differentiate, let's say log of the cosine and evaluate at zero, um, this would be, if do the calculation, well, this part here, we just contribute with the term, oh, there is a square here that I missed. This part, we just contribute with something like 2z divided by pi squared over 4. Oh, sorry, divided by uh, z squared minus pi squared over 4, 2n plus 1 squared. That would be a sum, n greater or equal to 0. And the other part would be just minus 2az minus ib. And then you have to evaluate this whole thing at zero. Well, then you get just a minus ib. Yes. But then what is this thing? Well, if you differentiate the log of cosine, you just get sine of a cosine. And if you evaluate at zero, that is zero. So this has to be zero, okay? So then you conclude that P is zero. Then the second calculation you do is you differentiate what? Oh, to show that A is zero, what you do, I guess, is you differentiating Y, the log of the moduli of the cosine, is that it? Yes. Um, yes, and then you use the fact, you use the following fact. Well, this function here, we showed in the proof that was a functional Poyer class already. And this function here equals this part, okay? So when I do this differentiation, I will get the same differentiation for this part plus uh, the dy log of model i of that part, okay? But this part is of Poya class. So I can definitely say that this is greater or equal than the same derivative for this term here. B is already zero, so we only have A. And then if you do that, what, so if you take the model i, I think it's gonna be something like, uh, x squared minus y squared. So let me, so this would be what? This would be, uh, let me take the model i and differentiate. So that would be what? Log of the model i, which I guess it will be log of what? The real part, so e to minus ax squared minus y squared, that's the real part. So when I take that and differentiate in y, I get minus, I get 2ay. Okay, great. But what is that? Well, that again, using that formula is i cosine prime, which is minus sine, so that would be minus sine divided by cosine of z, okay. So if I, so if I evaluate if z equals just i y and I send y to infinity, what happens here? Well, this part here is just gonna be something like e to the y plus e to minus y maybe. And in the, the bottom will be something like the same. Okay, so this bit here, we just converge to one. Okay, this bit here inside. So when you take the real part of minus i times z, so you probably converge into zero. Anyway, I don't care, it's converging to something. But the right hand side would be exploding if i was, a was positive, okay? So impossible. So it has to be zero. Okay, any questions in these two computations? This is the first.
So these are the two ways you show that B is zero and A is zero. So therefore this bit here, so therefore you conclude that cosine of Z is just the product and a greater or equal than zero of one minus C Z squared over over C squared, where C is just a pi over two, two N plus one. Okay. And now to finish, we have to prove that uh, Euler's uh, identity. And then what you do is just, you differentiate this thing twice. And so you can take the log and differentiate, differentiate twice, or you just different, yeah, they have to take the log. around the origin, which I can do. So if you do that, you get minus the sum of two z squared plus c squared divided by z squared minus c squared squared. And then uh, n greater or equal than zero and c is pi over two, two n plus one. But on the other hand, if you do the differentiation here, I guess you get minus one sine squared of z divided by cosine of z. And then now you can evaluate everything as zero. So then you take this, evaluate at z equals zero. So what do you get? you get that, let's cancel this sign. So you get one equals the sum of n greater or equal than zero. And in here you will, you will get two divided by c squared. So you get two divided by c squared. But what is c squared? This is pi squared over four, two n plus one squared. So that implies that one uh, yes, one over two n plus one is squared and greater or equal than zero equals pi squared, oh, pi squared over eight, which is what we wanted to show. This is like one in a million ways of showing this identity. Now I have several ways of showing this. I guess if you do the same factorization for the sign, there is a similar trick. Maybe it's a nice exercise. You do the same thing for the sign and you show its factorization uh, without any of the exponential factors. And then you use a similar trick to show uh, maybe not the odd ones, but you, I, th I think that you will get directly the, the sum of the inverse of the squares equals um, a pi squared over six. I guess. Anyway, cash questions here in this problem? Okay, if, if we don't have any more questions, then I can stop recording. Great, so thank you and See you uh, next Tuesday.